You're listening to The Upland Rookie, a podcast presented by Onyx Hunt, Final Rise, and a Nook Shook Professional Dog Food. And you're listening to episode 85, part two of my conversation with Todd Agnew from Spaniel Journal. And this podcast is also presented to you by OnX Hunt, the most comprehensive public and private land ownership data mapping tool in the world. Many tools and layers like crop types, tree species, waypoints, and so much more. Uh, The Onyx Elite membership is going to give you a ton of access to um, a whole bunch of benefits, uh, discounts on awesome gear. Um, If you're not using Onyx Hunt already, I highly encourage you to get over to onyxhunt.com and sign up today. And be sure to check out Anook Shook Professional Dog Food, the only sporting dog, high-performance dog food I'm feeding my string of dogs. Have been using this for several years, and Anook Shook has delivered and lived up to and surpassed all the hype you've been hearing about online, through friends, kennels, breeders, all that and it has just been a high quality premium food. Uh, I've been able to cut back several cups of food for my dogs, still keeping weight on them during season, during trialing, whatever it might be. These dogs are in best shape they've been in personally in a long, long time. And thanks to Anook Shook Professional Dog Food, they have four incredible formulas. Check them out at anookshookpro.com. And last but not least, Final Rise Gear. I am so pumped and proud to be representing the Final Rise brand. They have been producing year after year quality premium upland gear that is made for the hunter. The bird hunter who is putting on miles after miles, season after season, and wants gear to hold up to the elements of how you are hunting. You gotta look no further than finalrise.com. Check out the Summit Vest, the Summit XT Vest, which is brand new, the Sidekick Vest, as well as the Legacy. So many vest options, which are totally customizable. Um, I'm pretty darn confident you're gonna find something that works for you and your setup. Uh, So check them out at finalrise.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Upland Rookie Podcast. I'm your host, Will Larson, and I'm so glad you guys are joining us again for part two of my conversation with Todd Agnew from Spaniel Journals. We're unpacking a whole bunch of Spaniel breed uh, discussion, including Spaniel field trials, training, um, breeding, development of Spaniels, um, and just bird dogs in general. I had a really, really great conversation with Todd if you've not listened to part one yet, highly recommend jump back to, I think it's episode 84. You'll listen to part one, then come on back to part two, uh, pick up right where we left off. Hey, don't forget, get entered into the Gunner Fan Kit giveaway over at patreon.com. Get signed up today. Uh, we'll be giving away a Gunner Fan Kit 2.0 to one lucky winner uh, from the Patreon community. So get signed up and uh, you'll win a win, uh, brand new fan kit as well as an Upland Rookie hat, a couple stickers, all that good stuff. But you got to be signed up on the Patreon platform. <laughs> so anyways, um, we're going to keep this short. We're going to dive right back into our conversation with Todd Agnew. Um, th- th- there are. So technically, it's still the same breed. It hasn't okay. you know, split. But in practicality, it's definitely different. You know, Over the years, there's been some people that tried to you know, run half show and half field bred springers and try to get them titled. And I don't think anyone's been successful with that. I mean, I, I can't remember. I, I don't know what it is. 30s, 40s, whatever it is, last sure. time, you know, show dog was able to do that. What's interesting is if you look at some of the old national videos from, you know, the 50s, they look like show dogs because mm. clearly back then the, the field split bread, the wasn't field as, bred ones. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Huh. It, the, you know, the, the breed wasn't as split as it is now, obviously. Um, but, you know, those dogs just can't compete any more than, you know, our field dogs couldn't compete in the show ring. So, sure. you know, when you talk about confirmation, I think the reality is that the show people really need to rethink their confirmation because it's not functional, mm-hmm. their definition of confirmation. So, so at the same time, a picture of, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say at the same time, as a field person, 
you know, we should stop ignoring the confirmation. I mean, there's, there's, you know, everybody's got something to add and to offer if everybody's open-minded, mm. you know, so like straight legs, like, you know, just because a dog can run doesn't mean it's structurally built well. You know, just because it has a nose and can find sure. game doesn't mean that's good for the breed. The dog's legs are in different directions, you know. So, mm. uh, you know, we should not be ignoring it any more than I think the show people, you know, they shouldn't be ignoring it either. It's just, yeah. you know, it's same old American, you know, American story. We, uh, you know, we have... I have all the answers and nobody else knows what they're talking about, right? I mean, that's just <laughs> Sounds familiar. the world Sounds we familiar. live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, paint a picture. Like, what, what would a, a standard show Springer look like versus a, a, a maybe your ideal field bred Springer? Okay, again, con- con- you know, generalities ways. without without offending anybody. Sure. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the, you know, the show Springer – it tends to have more bone, um, tends to be a little bigger, um, droopier eyes, okay. longer ears, lower set ears, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, a lot more coat maybe, mm. um, feathering. So, you know, everything that we would hate as a hunter, just from a mm. maintenance standpoint, Oh, sure. Right. More maintenance to clean the dog up and all those types of things. Then when you get to non cosmetic things, um, the show springers tend to have worse mouths. They tend to be harder mouth. Okay. Uh they okay. tend to be more aggressive. Uh they tend to be more stubborn. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. That'd be the general stuff, I think. Yeah, no, that's that's good. I love that. Um, all right, moving on a little bit to the cocker. Then we we touched on them a little bit. You talked mm-hmm. about some of the differences, maybe from them to a to a Springer. Um, but first off, w- w- why the cocker craze? W- w- I mean, why do you think <sighs> I can't I can't scroll through social media without seeing someone picking up a new cocker? Um, they've just kind of taken over the <laughs> some of, some of the bird dog world. You could, what, what, you, you, you could just eliminate social media like us. You wouldn't have to see it. <laughs> yeah, there you, <laughs> you go. <laughs> I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Um, um, what, what well, you know, driving they're, that? They're, they're little, you know, and so mm-hmm. there's a size thing, and and they are cute, and they're full of mischief. And, and honestly, <laughs> sure. If 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 you have a very stressful job where you're mentally getting beat up day in and day out, go buy a cocker. It will make coming <laughs> home worth just tenfold. Okay. They are, are they just I mean, that people oriented? They are. They are they are masters of manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> and and even when even when they're being naughty, you're gonna laugh nonstop. I mean, it's just oh, you know, we we correct one and their tail will wag the entire time. You now, you know, we do this for we do this for a living. So as you can imagine, right. that right. you know, there isn't a lot of oh, oh Fido, come on, don't do sure. that, right? I mean, when when we correct a dog, it's a correction, okay? Right. But when we correct a cocker, the tail wags probably more. I mean, they thrive on it. It's like, just this, it's, is, this is exciting. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm get I'm getting attention. I mean, they're just, they're just you know, just crazy. So I, I don't oh know. I, I don't know what the craze is. You know, my uh, my pessimistic New England side says, you know, the writers have to come up with something new to write every so often. And you know, those magazines are famous for having you know the dog of the breed of the month, all those types of things. And yeah, yeah. Um, I think that you know, one of the great things about our industry is that you know, women have got so involved with shooting and, um, down here in the South, a lot of the plantation hunts and so forth, uh, the spouses like coming, you know, so the, the women like to come ride on the wagon and see the mules and hear the stories. And, you know, from that elevated perch, they can see the dogs run, even if they don't want to shoot. And that goes for the men as well, but you know, typically the women, well, you know, I think what the plantations found is that instead of in, you know, a 70 or 80 pound lab, that sits over there because it's so big they can put Mm -hmm. these cockers front and center with all these people on the wagon 
And it's wonderful. It truly is. I mean, it doesn't matter that the dogs overwhelmingly aren't trained. They run out there like Tasmanian devil. They make a bunch of noise. Some bird, some birds get up. They get shot, and yeah. you know, then the cocker comes back and is happy as a clam that there's someone there that you know to talk to it. You know, so I think from a business standpoint, sure. um, that's one component. The other thing that I think they figured out is, you know, we've all seen stories or seen video and so forth of people trying to go in and flush Bob White quail. And those pen raised birds, they'll run around all day long. You'll never get them to flush. Mm, sure. Well, there's just, there's just something about nature, Will, that when a canine goes in, they have a way of getting the birds to flush better than when we're trying to run around and get them to wow. get up in the air. And the cocker has really transformed the plantation hunts. It has really turned bad birds into workable birds and that's always the problem wow. with any preserve of any of any bird is if you have bad birds it really gives a bad presentation for the hunt absolutely so the cocker has made birds that used to be subpar usable wow. and that's okay. good because you know we're losing bir- we're losing bird suppliers all over the country and sure. like like all aspects people are retiring and young people didn't come on and take it and you know so uh it's just a you know, nature to yeah. be so oh, yeah. they have never, helped with those hunts. I would have thought that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point of view. Absolutely. Um, are the cockers and the springers, so, so moving to the field trial side of things, are they completely different trials for those two dogs or are they running together against each other? In the U.S. it's separate. In okay. Canada they run together. Okay. So okay. Um, now in Canada, they don't, you know, they don't have the cocker numbers or the springer numbers that we have in the States. Obviously, just look at the population difference. But that being said, in Canada, there's only ever been one cocker that has ever won the Spaniel Championship there. So one oh, wow. time okay. a cocker beat the, beat the springers. Okay. Well, so springers are dominating. So that there. also, they, they, you know, and they would here too. It's just there's a separate event for the, you know, for the cockers yeah. here. Now, a good cocker is a good cocker. I mean, and they're just as good as a springer. There's no question about that. But a thousand cockers, a thousand springers, the springer's better. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, take me through what is a what does a, a field trial in the states here look like for um, take either dog, you know, springer. Let's say, um, what's a field trial going to look like for them? Um, is it walking? Is it horseback? Uh, take me through that. Okay. Um, Essentially, they're the same trial, Cocker or Springer, right? So they run the same way. We run under the same set of rules. The Cocker might run in a little tighter um, beat because the dogs don't cover as much ground, you know. But um, okay. it's all walking. And on a weekend trial, a, a licensed trial, uh, it's three series. So in the first series, I'll run <clears throat> under under a judge, and then next to me will be somebody else running under a different judge. So if you think about it like hunting, it's your dog's running in front of you while you hunt and your buddy's off to your left running his dog and he covers his ground and you cover your ground. Okay. Okay. But okay. we don't so, carry so two a dogs gun. at the same time. So there's, yep. There's a gun between the two dogs and there's a gun outside of each dog. So there's three gunners. But okay. it's not you as the handler. You're just handling the Correct. Okay. Yep. It's actual gun team because, you know, they've passed the testing and all that stuff. Okay. Um, so you run and, you know, they put birds out and the the field, the beat is, you know, generally identified with, a, you know, a course. And you run generally for two or three contacts and you're responsible for all the game on your, on your beat and they're responsible for theirs. Uh, the dog has to quest in front of you and run depending on the wind. You know, should dictate how that do- how it looks. Um, uh, one thing that's different, typically though, from when we hunt, is if you're running next to me, Will, and your dog puts a bird up, my dog has to honor that. So if we see the bird in the air, the gun goes off, my dog has to sit, and your dog uh-huh. has to sit when it flushes flushes the bird. Then the bird gets shot. Neither dog is allowed to move. If it's your bird, the judge taps you and you send your dog for the retrieve. While your dog is out on the retrieve, my dog has to honor. And they can do it a couple of different ways. They may have to sit out there. So if that bird gets shot on my course right in front of my dog, my dog has to sit there while your dog runs over there and picks the bird up in front of him. Oh, wow. If it 
if it's not in on our beat, let's say, usually the judge will say, handle how you want. You can call your dog in. You know, I could call my dog in and have it sit in front of me while your dog okay. is making the retrieve. Okay. And then we continue down and now maybe my dog puts up a bird. Now your dog is going to have to honor. Okay. okay. So that goes on until all the dogs have run once. The dogs that don't do any blatant fault that is automatic disqualification, the judges generally will invite those dogs back for the second series, but now you run under the other judge. So the second series will be oh. just like the first series, except for people swap what judge they run under. Okay. And then they'll go through the second series. At the end of the second series, the judges will get together and they'll negotiate on which dogs they can agree they want to see again that are worthy. And so sure. they'll bring let's, – let's say the trial starts with 30 dogs. There's probably going to be 22 to 25 of them back to the second series. And then there's probably going to be 10 of them or so back to the third. And okay. in the third series, those are the dogs that had the best work of the day. And now you don't run with a bracemate. You run by yourself, but under both judges. Now both judges are uh -huh. watching you run your dog. And so then they run through okay. whatever was in the third series. Let's call it 10 dogs. And then they'll powwow and do their placements. At wow. a national, which – is the same setup really, except for in the national, there's two additional series. So instead of running two series and then the third, you'll run four series back and forth to the judges before the fifth series will you run by yourself under both judges in the fifth. Wow. And then the national, you do have to make a couple water retrieves and, you know, so. Okay. How many, how many dogs are we talking would, would go to a national total? 100 plus. 100 plus. plus. Yep. They got to wow. qualify, which okay. isn't, you know, these days isn't particularly difficult. They've lowered the, the qualification because, you know, the game's shrinking, like, you know, sure. a lot of this stuff. Um, I think last year the Springer, Springer Open had maybe 120, something like that. I think the Cocker had maybe just under under 100 or something. And the um, Now, in there's an Open, which is for the pros, and amateurs can run the open as well. And then oh, there's gotcha. an amateur national. You know, the amateur national is only for the amateurs. And that's, Pros can't run that's true for both the – right. That, and, the, and Springers and Cockers both have an open and an amateur. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is all under AKC, correct? These are AKC events? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I was going to ask you – Oh, on the event, it just slipped my mind. AKC event. Ah, crap. Okay, I lost it. I will maybe come back to it if I remember. <laughs> okay. Um, but no, that sounds that sounds awesome. Um, are those uh are are those events? Oh, hunt test. Sorry, I think I finally remembered mm -hmm. hunt test. Are you also running hunt tests with your dogs, or are you primarily sticking I, on the field trial side of things? I am not, to be honest. I. I really don't have anything good to say about the hunt test. You know, okay. I think oh, wow. on okay. paper, uh, you know, on, on paper, I think it's wonderful when um, uh, Henry and Reeks set that thing up, or it was Art Rogers, I guess. Uh, when they set that up, I think it was great intentions, um, but the the quality overwhelmingly has really dropped. Mm -hmm. um, the standard has dropped. I mean, they have about, I don't know what it is, 25 different breeds that can run. And what, what I don't like, predominantly with it is that every breed gets to write in what the standard is. So for example, oh. there are breeds that in the description, they say that the dog will hesitate on the flush. And so therefore that dog can't be failed because that's in the breed. And oh, wow. my argument would be is it's not called a dog game. It's not called a dog test. It's called a hunt test. And if the dog sure. hesitates, you're never going to get that wild pheasant. That bird's just going to oh, keep wow. running off. Sure. So I I have a problem with, you know, and, and it's really bad down here in the south, to be honest, um, uh -huh. with the bulk of the dogs that you could never hunt. Hmm. They're passing. And, of course, it's all about bragging rights. It's all about them breeding puppies. So you have sure. all these show dogs of various breeds that get these hunt test titles, and they just get get to pump out more puppies. It, it's really, it, oh, it's negligent 
in my in my opinion. It's uh, it makes right. me wonder why we're paying the AKC. Right. You know, I mean, and and they just pass the buck. They say, well, the you know the the parent club they set it up. They well then then why are you even involved? <laughs> so each breed. So you're saying breeds can kind of dictate the standards. So let's say, just help me understand that. So let's say the cocker association or whatever the cocker or whatever they can kind of write in and say, hey, here's kind of our standard we want the hunt has to be judged for our cockers. Um, in a sense, not they can't. They can't set up what the test is. They can set up what the dog looks like when it's doing it. And overwhelmingly, the issue is in the field. Okay, gotcha. so there there are breeds that hesitate a lot. I mean, they essentially point. Mm. These are flushing hunt <laughs> tests, not pointing hunt sure. tests. Okay, and so you know you'll have people that go to the judge and they'll hand them the written description because they don't because they want to make sure they don't get knocked for it. Okay. I mean, it's, 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 it, it's, sure. you know, I, I've never, I, I've been told to watch it. Evidently it's a great movie. I never have, but there was that parody best in show. Okay. Uh, that movie I've best in that. show or something. Okay. I think maybe it's Will Ferrell. It's about, you okay. know, dog show people. Sure. Evidently. Um, <laughs> this is what it is. It's, oh, it's just, it's, it's just amazing. So things like, um, so they have to do a piece on the gra- on the land. Okay, and there's a junior, senior, and master, and yeah. in theory, they um, each level that goes up, it should be more in a better format. Okay, and at the master right. level, they're supposed to be steady in the wing and shot, and then they have to go do at depend on the level a hunt dead. Think of a blind retrieve, but it's a it's okay. a hunt dead they call it and you know it doesn't have to be exactly on the line and so forth then they have to make a a water retrieve and then at the master level they have to make a a water blind type thing well on the hunt dead depending on the level senior or master i think it's between i don't know 40 and 60 yards let's call it and i mean it's not outrageous by any stretch and for a hunter that's probably normal because let's face it, if you shoot a bird out there you're probably going to walk up with your dog if you're hunting right you're not going to stand out there and feel hey sure. watch me handle my dog at 100 yards look at me right you're gonna you want to go get the bird right so <laughs> yeah, yeah so it, you know it's, it, it's 40 to 60 yards and so a couple things about the rule you can walk up halfway so now that means it's a 20 to 30 yard hunt oh, down okay. <laughs> okay okay oh, gosh. and then now now you can get marked down for it but you can't fail because of it and then oh, they've okay. they've got written in there that i think the wording is typically it shall should not take more than five minutes well that has become essentially law that you have five minutes if i oh. can walk over and pick the bird up before my dog can get it how is that dog helping the hunt? <laughs> I mean, I can walk 20 yards and pick the bird up in far less than five minutes. Oh, gosh. I mean, it's oh, just it, 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 it's just crazy. Yeah, it's, 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 cutting, just, cor- it's cutting corners, it sounds like. It's, it's cutting corners on the intention it, of these bird dogs. It is. I, I used to think that they're all on our side, right? Pro-gun, sure. pro-hunting, but they're not. They're not. It's just a. It's just a dog game. And if they would change the name, I would never have another ill thing to say about it. Mm. But it's far but, cry from a hunt test. Right. Far, far cry. There's, there's a there's a spaniel, very good, you know, Springer and Cocker guy up in Wisconsin named Jason Givens. And so you know we see him, we run in, and we're peers and so forth in, in the in the world. Well, you know, he's he's very good. I got a lot of respect for him. So years ago, he and I were talking about the hunt test and about the junior level. And he explained it better to me than anybody has ever explained it. He said, essentially, at the junior level, if he's judging the hunt test, this is what he thinks. Forget about all these categories and rules and everything else. He watches the dog. If Does the dog add to the hunt or does the dog hurt the hunt? If it adds to the hunt, it passes. If it hurts the hunt, it fails. I mean, I, I can't, I can't ex- come up with anything to explain it any yeah. better than that. If it's a hunt yeah. test, is it helping the hunt or not? Sure. But wow. You know, they get, yeah. you know so I, it, just, I, it makes total sense, man. It makes total sense. I love, <laughs> I love hearing your passion about it too. Cause <laughs> I just, just, well, we have, we have a lot it. of, a lot of our, our clients are hunt test sure. people. 
and they st- they still protest me, and they were involved for years, and they judge them, and they so their eyes have been opened up. But and it has its right. place, and I think if you if sure. people go there with a perspective, I think that is great. And a lot of these breeds, they have nothing else. That is all they have. That's so their I, you know, I get that, yeah. but I don't believe that's any excuse to have a low standard. Ah, uh, absolutely. So. Oh, absolutely. Okay. A couple more things here. A uh, cu- couple of questions for you. Um, again, mm-hmm. around the, around the spaniel breeds here. Um, so with, with your flushing dogs, let's take the Cocker and Springer. Um, you know, talk to me about what are some of the things that you're looking for um, when, when picking out a puppy, um, thinking a young pup from a litter, let's say you're, you're, you're picking up a new pup from a litter. Um, and help our listeners understand, like, what are some signs or things you're looking for um, in that pup when you're picking one? Honestly? Yes, honestly. <laughs> I don't pay any attention. Really? <laughs> Nothing at all. I yep, I want the litter because of the paperwork. You know, sure. I probably I probably know something about the parents at this point, you know, we're so tied in. Um uh, Christina picks the puppies based on which one she likes the looks of. Okay. I think it, I think it's a crapshoot. I just I, I think anyone <laughs> that says they can they can pick a puppy is they're just naive. Sure. Right. We we have we have litters and the puppies change on a daily basis and it's we all fall in love with the puppy whichever puppy we get so you're gonna like any of them that you get mm-hmm. and I, I think you you get the best pedigree you can yeah however you define that but sure. you get the best pedigree that you can and then you pick the one that you like the looks of the best. I, I think mm. it's that simple. I mean, I, I would, yeah. I wouldn't even pick by, you know, the most successful puppies I've had is when I, someone just sent me the puppy. Yeah. To be <laughs> wow. honest. And, and, so, so you're and putting because, your stock and your trust in the, in the pedigree and the parents and grandparents I, and so on. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, I agree. Now, um, that's not the easiest thing for the general public. Sure. You know, so, I mean, I know who I'm going to call for puppies. I know the background of the dogs. I know, you know, all those types of things. It, you know, it, it's that, should I get a puppy from the UK? Okay. Well, that's the, well, I can't go see those dogs. I mean, we have all the, all the videos, all their nationals. And so we're doing whatever research we can, but you know, in the States, I see a whole lot more of the dogs. And of course I'm only buying top end field trial stock. And right. I would say the general public, it'd be best if they only did that as well. Not that that's any guarantee and not that, you know, um, listen, we won the national in 2018 with riot and riot is the greatest, most talented springer I've ever seen in my life. He, the things that that dog can do. And of course I get to hunt the crap out of that dog. So I, I mean, the best things that dog has ever done was never done in the field trial. It was done when we were hunting, but that being said, um, I'm not going to tell you that when we won the national, that that was the best dog in the country Hmm. because there there were only a hundred dogs, 110, whatever it was. And the judges thought he was, and I, and obviously I'm not giving it back and I don't dispute, dispute the judges. He had, you know, he had a wonderful week, but what about the other 200,000 springers that weren't there? Hmm. So, you know, field trialers, you know, we have a habit of being pretty proud of ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, I'd like to keep things in more perspective. Yeah. That uh, like you're not putting all your ground. stock just on what, what they won, right? Like you're not saying, well, just because they won a national, that means they're the best dog. Correct. Like, okay. I, I, I am not. All I'm saying is that it's the only test we have. So for the general public, I do think they are better going with high-end field trial stock because it's the only thing they have. I mean, their buddy, you know, John says, oh, my, you know, uh, my dog's really good. Well, if the dog was never tested against other dogs, how do we know it's really good other than we know everybody loves their dog? And it may be, that dog may be better than any dog I've ever seen in my life, but we just don't know. Right. Where someone that's really tied in and knows a lot of these dogs, you know, I'm probably better able to get a puppy from a dog that hasn't been titled hmm. um, and, and have a better chance with that because I know all the other dogs. I know the background. I know. So, sure. I, you know, although I'm a hunter at heart and I don't like 
a lot of what the field trials offer the general public because I don't think they offer very much. I think they use the general public as a place to dump their dogs that they've screwed up. Mm. And I think that's really unfortunate. But then that's why the general public kind of has it. Not kind of, they do. They have a, tend to have a negative you know, view of the field trial world. And, oh, I, don't, I don't need a field trial. I don't want a field trial. Let me tell you, anyone that wants a Springer, they should all wish that they could have a dog that won the national. Because there's no bad dogs that mm. win nationals. Okay, they may right. have had one. Give your, week. Set yourself they up for. I mean, I, I mean, Riot's the best hunting dog I've ever had. Okay, so I mean, it it's it's a big deal those field trial dogs. I just don't like the field trial community thinking that the hunting community is you know is below us. Mm. The be, the best bird dogs I've ever needed were when I was hunting, not at the field trial. It's way harder to find pheasants going across, you know, western Kansas. That's much mm. more difficult than it is to find a bird at a field trial. So right. I just, as much as I've become a field trialer, I just woke up one day and realized I am now a field trialer. That wasn't my intention, but you right. know, that, that's what I am. And, and, and I like them. And I like the competition. And I like the proving ground. I like all those aspects of it. I just refuse to fall into the trap that we somehow are better and than that's the, vast the end all majority. be all. Yeah, it just it, it just isn't. But when it comes to yeah. a pedigree, it is the only proving ground. Yeah. So you should oh. put you should put stock in that. Todd, I love that. I love that perspective you have on, on those two things because because again, I, I've I've personally met lots of people who it's one or the other. It's oh, it's you know only basing off the field trial accomplishments of what that dog has done. Well, have you seen them on wild birds? Like what kind of dog is that dog on, on wild birds? And I get asked all the time, what's one piece of gear you would never hunt without? Well, that is easy. It's Onyx Hunt. Onyx Hunt is the number one digital mapping software in the world. I've been using it for several years and it makes hunting uh, private and public land incredibly easy. Right at your fingertips, get so much information and data that you can pull up on the road hunting. Uh, not to mention, this is an app on your phone or your iPad, but they just released an uh, Apple CarPlay version. So if you have Apple CarPlay in your vehicle, plug in your phone and get all your pins and data with Onyx right on your vehicle's display. Super sweet. Check out onyxhunt.com. Use promo code ROOKIE20. Save you 20% on your Onyx membership today. Um, so I love that perspective. You can have kind of holding both those things a little bit loosely and saying that's, that's something I, I, to I'll, test. I'll, like you I'll said. give you, a, well, I'll give you a, a perspective. So we had a dog, I mean, we've had lots of dogs, but so this dog that got titled and everybody loved this dog and the dog was super. I mean, it really was, was a wonderful dog. Um, and a lot of success with it. That dog couldn't find a bird in a phone booth. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it just, it just couldn't, but in a field trial, it never lacked nose hmm. because it's, a, you know, it, it, it's a setup, it's a game. And sure. part of the game is the handler's job to manage the dog and put it in the right position so it can be successful. Well, that's a whole lot different than going across, you know, a, a mile square CRP grass where birds could be anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so that dog always, always had the worst nose in the kennel. Never hmm. once did he have an inferior nose at a field trial. Wow. Okay, and lots of people, you know, have, have those those stories. Sure. Um, uh, uh, doesn't mean that he was a bad dog. It just he had the right. worst nose in the kennel. Yeah. That's fascinating. That is fascinating. Um, one more question here for you. Um, who would you who would you say a, a flushing breed is for? Again, take the cocker and Springer. Like who who would you say that those kind of dogs are for? Maybe type of bird someone wants to hunt, terrain where they live. Um, yeah. Well, clearly, you know, it, it, it's a pheasant dog. I mean, number one, I'm. You know, I believe in specialization. I don't believe there's a dog out there that can do everything for everybody or is great on every every type of game um you know if if all i was interested in was grouse and woodcock you know i'd get a setter it just okay. that's that's what i would have if all i was interested in was ducks i'd get a retriever you know and for me it'd be, you know it'd be a lab 
Um, and like, sure. like Henry Ford said, it'd be a black lab. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if all I did was quail, I'd get a pointer, you know, an English okay. pointer. Um, but if I was doing pheasants, uh, and I was a fe- avid pheasant hunter, clearly I'd be getting a, a, a springer or a cocker. There's, there's no question okay. about that. Now, yeah. all those breeds I mentioned can do other games. Right. Okay. So, you know, Every dog, all our field trial dogs, they all hunt. We leave mid-August, and we're out there into November. Right? They hunt a lot. I don't just mean you know an hour on Saturdays at the local preserve. I mean they're out there, they're hunting. Sure. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're the best grouse dog. Um, and you know people hunt you know pheasants with pointer dogs all the time. So it doesn't mean that a pointer can't hunt pheasants and and so forth. Uh, the spaniels down here, they use them for retrieving all the time, wood ducks and so forth. But, you know, they can't deal with the, the cold, nasty weather like a lab and so forth. So sure. I think it, I think if you're an upland generalist, I think the, the flushing dogs are a good way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the pointing dogs can be, you know, a mix with because of range. So if you mm-hmm. live out west, I think you know any pointing dog will fit the bill because it tends to be big country. <laughs> sure. If you live right, out right. if you live out east, you know, and you want a pointer or a setter, uh, you know, you're going to have some limitations unless you've got some ground, right. you know. And some of the other pointing dogs, you know, the the Britneys, I just don't know enough about them to where I would go to get one with the range that I'd be mm-hmm. you know, would be happy with, or you know the you know some of those other pointing you know the short hair i think that sure. i think the short hair came about because it was kind of an in-between dog you know um mm-hmm. range wise um but I, I i i i think whatever breed you get a well-trained dog is a well-trained dog mm-hmm. i don't believe that you know we get a lot of calls about the cocker from people that are i'm um, getting to be 70 i can't run a pointing dog anymore let me tell you something. There is no hunt that I've ever been on that is more miserable than a high-quality flushing dog that is not trained. You'll oh. never pull the trigger, and the dog will never be near you because he will just rid the county of every bird he can find. At least an untrained pointing dog sure. is going to at least pause when it smells a bird. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> might actually have a chance, chance to yeah. get up. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but like a, a quality springer untrained i can't think of a more miserable hunt <laughs> oh, so you know i, I think oh, a well-trained that's good. dog that's good is, advice yeah regardless of breed well-trained dog yeah oh that's good well todd as we uh, as we wrap this thing up sir um we got our, our closing question and a rapid a couple of rapid fire ones um i know you, you kind of covered yeah. the uh the closing question i always like to ask you know what advice would you give uh you know the the, the rookie out there someone just getting started uh, i know you touched on that a little bit earlier in the episode anything you would you would add to that or change yeah i actually wrote some stuff down for you on that one. <laughs> oh, love it love it i'm prepared todd um <laughs> um I, I'd encourage them to start simple. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, their goals are going to change. If they stick with it, what is interest in of a priority today is going to be different a couple of years down the road as they mm-hmm. get more comfortable and they learn more. Um, you know, most people are worried about high powered dogs. Um, and when you're new, that can be intimidating. And when you live in the suburbs, that can be intimidating. I get all of that. But if they get some help, it'll be manageable. And when there are very few birds around, at 2 in the afternoon in an arid environment, you're going to really want that high-powered dog because it's yeah. the only chance you have to find game. Okay? Sure. Um, don't follow the crowd. So the magazines are famous. I think is it August where they give all their hunting outlook? Don't worry. The places that they say there are no birds, we made a career of going to those places. There's always birds. It's just a question mm-hmm. of how hard you want to work. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is while they're with their dog, I, I would encourage them to do everything they can to learn how to read their dog. Okay. The, the, when it comes to a spaniel, most people that are new to spaniels, they think the dog is always on game. 
because you have a lot of tail action and particularly the cockers, you know, it's even magnified. Um, But to really learn when their dog is on game as opposed to when it's just questing, because then Mm -hmm. that means they got an opportunity to prepare, not just for the shot, but prepare, you know, where the roads, where the railroad tracks, they can take a look, where's the danger zones, where's everybody standing, where if they're never prepared that their dog is on game, things are going to happen really fast and then they're not ready. Yeah. Oh, that's great, Todd. That is great. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, some good advice right there. Um, okay. A couple, a uh, couple rapid fire questions for you and we'll, uh, we'll bring this thing home. Um, so you can just kind of give me your off the cuff answer and, uh, we'll cruise through these, uh, for you, Todd, what came first, the gun, the dog, or the bird? What came first in life? Yeah. What, what uh, what, out of those things, what came first for you? What, what was kind of that first, oh, uh, first love? The dog, the dog for dog. sure. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, you when you're hunting the table. Oh yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, what, uh, what gun are you carrying into the field and why? Um, side by side for sure. And, okay. um, 20 gauge, 20 gauge. 20 just, gauge it, side by it, side. You know, you, you can shoot all game with a 20 gauge. I love it. I'm a, I'm a big 20 gauge fan myself. Um, Pick, oh, well, my next question, can I, I was going to say pick one gauge to use for the rest of your life. Is that the 20 gauge? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, favorite breed of dogs besides the ones you own? Um, I, boy, there's, there's a lot of them, Will. <laughs> <laughs> this one gets everyone. I mean, this my, one gets everyone. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I like foxhounds. Foxhounds. Okay. Yep. Yep. I just think that. And did you? Watching that pack and the social interaction of that pack is just remarkable. Did you do some some running some hound dogs back in the day? Uh, yeah, not fox hounds, but hounds. I've been hounds. With lots of hounds. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Very cool. I'd love to, love to get out with some hounds someday. That would be that'd be fun. Um, favorite bird to hunt and why? Uh, grouse is. I find it to be the most challenging. You know, other than chucker, but those days are beyond me. I think we shot chucker in Idaho in 07 or 08. I just don't think I could go do that again. You know, that's just, <laughs> you're like, I'm just, good. I'm done. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's just, that's just brutal. Um, yeah. but that, you know, the grouse, the grouse is just, it's just amazing to me how they, how they can just always put cover between you and them. They just mm-hmm. have a knack for the yeah. one place that they can escape without you seeing them. They seem to find it's, it's <laughs> remarkable. Smart little birds. <laughs> yep. Oh yep. gosh. All right. Uh, two more here. Uh, your go-to snack on a hunting trip. Uh, almost anything with peanut butter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, peanut butter, whatever you're, it's in your truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love it. And then uh, last one, beverage of choice after a hunt. Uh, Any good single malt. Good single malt. Okay. All right. Well, Todd, thank you so, so much uh, for taking the time and uh, unpacking more about the Spaniels and just some of your journey and experiences that you've had. I've, uh, I've greatly, greatly appreciated it. Thank you, Will. Absolutely. And where can, uh, Todd, where can people, uh, if they have questions or want to follow along, want to learn more about your kennel, what's the best place for them to, uh, to go to find out more? Uh, spanieltraining.com or cranyhill.com. Um, on, from there, they can, you know, get any of the stuff that we pedal and the courses and that type of stuff, as well as, you know, they can send, you know, information. But l- like I said, that all goes to Christina and she's filtering through it and, um, you know, this phone number, whatever, everything, everything there. The easiest thing is probably just go to the website. Okay. And our, uh, one thing I forgot to ask you, are, are you doing any kind of clinics or things that you'll, you'll travel, travel around to do any kind of seminars or anything like that yet? Or Yeah. Um, we, we have traveled around in the past quite a bit. These days we usually just have them here. Um, just I'm on the road enough as it is, but you know, January, we always have our seminar in January. Sometimes we'll have another one as well. Um, we've got an online puppy course, oh, very uh, cool. you know, streaming, a streaming thing. And, and then we have a, you know, a training forum, but you know, the training forum, you know, 
ton of information on their will, but you know, it's very raw. It's just periodically Christina comes out and just films me training and mm. whatever I'm doing that day at that time with that dog. So it's not a sure. step one, step two, step three. It's just a, a narrated, uh, you know what? I don't know what's going on with this dog. I think that, yeah. you know, it's very raw, you know, yeah. which is great. Um, but you know, that's, you know, that, uh, that's a monthly thing. I think the course is just a flat fee. Okay. Um, you know, and then, the, you know, there's blog stuff and there's a bunch of links to other podcasts, you know, just different stuff on there. So sure, the, sure. the well, website's I, I pretty link all, that website. all encompassing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll link the website in the uh, the show description here and uh, some point people over there if they have questions or want to uh, check any of that out. So, um, Todd, thank you again. This has been so much fun and uh, I'm sure we'll be hey, talking Will, to you soon. Will, Will can, I, can I ask you a couple of questions? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, what hunting are you doing out there? Uh, so I'm running, I'm running Britney's, I'm running pointy dogs and I, uh, I'm getting after some mountain grouse. Um, sharp tail grouse are probably my favorite out in the prairies. Um, so, but I, I mainly travel out of state. Um, so some mountain grouse yeah. I'll do here in Colorado, but then, uh, some of the, whether it's sharp tails or Hungarian partridge, I've been traveling to Nebraska, North Dakota, Montana, stuff like that. Okay. So the, um, when you say mountain grouse, you talk about forest grouse, blue grouse, that type of thing. Blue, blue grouse, yep, yep. yep. We got a pretty grouse, good, okay. uh, pretty good population here in Colorado. Okay, and do you go north for that, or are you going south for that? From where you're at, from where I am, um, I mean, the blue grouse are going to be in, anywhere in the mountains, pretty much. Um, so you could go north, okay. northwest. I mean, somewhere west of me. I'm, I'm just south of Denver, so okay. I'm heading west and, uh, and and chasing blue grouse. Okay. Yeah. So I was just going to say we, we were up there, I guess, dot zero is where you go up to the flat tops. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and it was, you know, there were a lot of birds up there, you know, this is a bunch of years ago, but, sure. um, tough, tough walking though. I mean, you get up 10,000 feet. Oh yeah. <laughs> especially for out of staters, especially <laughs> yeah. you better be bringing was, some cans of oxygen. <laughs> That's right. It was, it, it was different for, you know, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but then you guys got, got ptarmigan up there too. Yes, yes. I have not chased those yet. I, I've known some guys who are, are successful on them. Um, I have not. I mean, because that, that you're ptarmigan, yeah, you're getting up even higher, getting 12, 13,000 feet yeah. for, for some of those guys. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely on my list to try someday uh, some ptarmigan. But. All right. Great. Hey, Will, you have a good day. So, yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Todd. And, Todd, hang right, on bye-bye. one second before you hang up here. Um, okay. Do you see on your screen, uh, say it says uploading 99%? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So we're just, just going to wait until that hits 100, and then you can close out your uh, your app. So I'm going to hit right. stop on the recording, but we'll still, be, we'll still be connected. So hang on one second. Okay. Well, that's a wrap of episode 85, part two of my conversation with Todd. Todd, thank you so much for taking the time and unpacking more about the Spaniel world, specifically the Springer. It's definitely got me curious. Um, Sounds like an incredible dog as well as the Cocker. And so um, I learned a lot. We had some laughs. I really appreciate you unpacking uh, more about those breeds and uh, your journey into upland hunting, training, breeding, all those things. Hey guys, don't forget to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Greatly help the show get out there to more hunters, more bird dog lovers, just like you. Hey, stay tuned next week. I have a very, very special guest joining the podcast. Um, I think he's never done a podcast before. It's maybe a first. I'm super excited for the next one. Um, Stay tuned. Not going to give it away who it is, but... Again, don't don't quote me 100%, but I'm pretty sure he's not been on a hunting podcast before. So get ready. It's going to be a good one. Um, Yeah, stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. It's going to come out soon. Um, Again, thanks for listening. Uh, Until next time, go put some miles on those boots and follow your favorite bird dog. Take care.